Welcome to another episode of Money in the Bank with Frank. How much is enough? How much is too much? Art on this episode, 2024 inaugural edition of Money in the Bank with Frank. We've got Maxwell Davidson IV with us. We're going to talk a little bit about art, where we see it in different art galleries, and is it worth it? Stay tuned and we'll talk about it. We went out to um, Fredericksburg this past weekend, and Virginia? Uh, what's that? Virginia? Or- no, Fredericksburg. Sorry, Texas. Yeah, the yeah. the German part of Texas the, in the hill country, close to Austin. Nice. And uh, we, you know, we we were limited in our options because we have the the puppy, and there's uh, it's right. it's Christmas. There's no one around. We're not leaving her at the mill, so we we brought her with us. And uh, of course, when you travel like that, you're not used to all the different drier air regular air right and so it's the hill country it's it was very dry so i woke up with this sinus headache that i haven't had wow. for years and it was like wow those days where i don't have this or i should take those i should appreciate I those a little more <laughs> i know it's it's uh i was just i was basically i was in orlando with my oldest for a soccer tournament and uh so we sort of escaped the this the flu part of the uh and now I've come home and it's, of course, the sniffles. And, yeah. You know, yeah. It's just can't win. Yeah. Um, but um, anyway. Well, good Max. To see you. Happy New Year. Yeah. Happy New Year. Welcome back to the show. Welcome back Thank to uh, Money in the Bank with Frank. I am so happy that we could have this one today because, as I, um, I sent you some clips while I was down there, and I was like, this is the kind of stuff that drives people to, like, not – no, and to hesitate. And right. um, boy, it was fun because there were some pictures I really liked. And I was like, wow, that frame is amazing. You could pretty much put anything in there and I'd buy it. Right. But then again, right. then you see the sticker shock and you're like, I don't know. Right. I don't Wait, know. Why Why is this that? Yeah. 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 What's the justification? Is this guy dead or alive? What's right. his, what is his work like? And, you know, you never know. There's like, you know, three or four different art galleries on that street. So, like, I don't know. Right. right. So I thought it would be really great to talk about, you know, some of these pictures. I think I loaded up so hell he'll he'll show um some yep, of the different perfect. stuff and we could talk a little bit about what do you think? Like what are the things that people should do in this situation? Obviously, like in the case of art for decoration in your house because you like it, that's one thing, but right. Is there a similar price point where maybe you should have considered buying something from xyz western artist which would have been in the same ballpark and has or will hold value right exactly um yeah so you know this, this also um you know sort of falls under the um category of local art which um it gets into a um a different um sort of idea that you are buying something to give you the memory of somewhere you've been or somewhere you have a second home or somewhere you live. Um, and then you're dealing with a, um, a sentimental value, you know, and sentimental value is sort of the, um, the, the dirty word in the art business because uh, sentimental value doesn't uh, make you a profit at the end of the day. It, 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 it gives you joy, which is as we, you and I have talked about something that art, gives you as an investment that other things don't. Right. But um, you know, it, it is it is important to, you know, know what you're buying and to know that you are buying something that is going to take up your money for a considerable time. You are going to enjoy it, but at the end of the journey with the art, is it going to be something you get the money out of? Um, and you know, Western art, certainly not my um, huge field of expertise, but I do know there's a good market for certain artists. Yeah. Many, of the, many of the good Western artists that um, have serious markets were, um, in fact, some of the artists that um, uh, Roosevelt um, uh, sent uh, in the WPA out West 
to document the 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 West as it as it sort of was it, at the time, yeah. Right. And and also the West was was populized and populated. And it was it was something that the, the government very much wanted to get sort of a last shot of. So they sent a lot of photographers, a lot of painters out there to document the American Indian and 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 the sort of the Western landscape. Um, so uh, those artists who have, who did that in the sort of from sort of 1890 into the sort of Roosevelt years, there is some serious value there. Um, mm -hmm. Artists like Farney, and then some of the photographers like Ansel Adams, and you know, um, who, were, who, were, who were employed by the government um, uh -huh. uh, to, to go and do this. Um, I know that's not what we're looking at here. Uh, we're looking at something you saw in a um, sort of a smaller town arts art gallery. Yes. Yeah, and so Hill, I'm not sure. Could you share with him so he can see what these pictures are that we're looking at? Uh, yeah. Uh, can you see them, Max? I see. Um, yeah, I see a um, a street scene. Yeah, a, exactly, a, exactly. I don't, I can't tell if it's a saloon or a. Yeah, it looks uh, like a hotel, old western like saloon, yeah. and obviously you see the beautiful frame. Yes, there we go. That's that's helpful. Yeah, and yeah, then there's it's got that sort of uh, that sort of feeling of isolation that that you see in a lot of these sort of western scenes. The the quote unquote one horse town. <laughs> right. Um, and then, there's two horses. But there were there's there's a number of things that I found. Like this is just one that I really liked. And then my wife was immediately, oh my God, if you love that, I want to get it for you. I was like, oh, stop. I'm not buying yeah. anything until <laughs> yeah. I talk yeah. to Max. Just, and this is those okay emotions. Like something and not buy it. Yeah, like just wait. Yeah. <laughs> you know? But um there you know, this gallery uh had Diff a lot of different types of art. So, Hill, can you go to one of the pictures that shows? Oh, this was my favorite by far. This was my favorite. It's uh, it's it's by Tegan, age four, and the it. price is priceless. Uh, Isn't that great? Yeah. There we go. <laughs> this this introduces a question. I have a question, Max. Um, yes. So, Frank just said he told his wife not to buy something he liked. Um, what if you really like it? Well, then I think you get into the, the, the hundred questions that, that me as an advisor would ask being like, what's your budget? If your budget is $50,000 and this painting's $500, have at it. You yeah. know, it's going to look great in the study. It's going to look great over little Frankie's bed. You know, um, it, 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 it's not that there are purchases that are sort of like at the supermarket um, where you're like, oh, I have to read that Us Magazine article. And so you buy it for $4.95. Um, there are definitely, I've definitely, you know, seen that in the art world. Um, but if it's something you like because you liked it in this store and it's something that's pushing your budget, then I really think you have to stop and think and do your research and, you know, cross your T's and dot your I's and make sure that there's not this market out there that maybe um, is far under what you're about to pay um, or that there's no market for, for said artist, you know. Um, is the artist dead or alive? In other words, is the artist, will the artist be making more of these? Uh, you know. Can I it, ask a, let me, let me step in and ask a, a, a question. So I had a conversation with a jeweler recently. I don't know if I had this conversation with you. And one of the yeah, things that he said to me when I asked him, because again, he's a he's a, a a jeweler here in town. He is a you know his family came down to Texas and was the diamond buyer for Neiman Marcus. Like he was, they, their family was the only ones that actually came here. All the rest of them were up in the New York New you know area, sure on um, on Maiden Lane. But just chatting with him about my segment on art, and I I had asked him specifically about you know insuring it and some things about that of that nature, and he said, yeah, we're Art dealers and and jewelers don't see eye to eye on a lot of things. And, you know, for me as a jeweler, you know, I have overhead. And by the way, do not take any offense. I'm quoting. I have overhead. I've got commodities. I've got to buy the diamonds. I have to buy the precious metals. Then I have to pay the people to actually make it. And he said, yeah, for me, yeah, and then and the thing that, that artists do is that they 
in my opinion, this is his words, in my opinion, it's, it's intellectual gambling because you don't really know whether or not that artist is going to stand the test of time. Uh, while with jewelry, yeah, ours is going to go to zero. You could find this in a state sale for a hundred bucks or $200 if no one's paying attention after someone passes away, but you're able to depreciate it, depreciate the joy of that purchase over your lifetime. So you're not buying it yeah. for the future and as an investment, you're buying jewelry for the right now. And maybe this is the kind of thing, like these types of art that you would put in your house sometimes could be that depreciable joy. Yeah, I, I look. This is a this is this is a good topic, uh, and it's not an easily easily answerable one. But I, what I would say is, I I don't agree that 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 um, there's no sort of intrinsic market or value for jewels because one look at the gold standard that fluctuates daily. Um, you know, when when markets are down, the gold, gold market's usually up. Uh, and vice versa. Um, the other thing I would say is, when you buy a diamond, um, you're you're basing it on its on its flawlessness. Um, it's it's no different than buying a good Jackson Pollock or a you know a a, a good Alexander Calder. Um, the experts know which ones are the good ones, which periods the artist painted in or sculpted in are the good periods not a, not not a lot of difference from uh it's been a while since i got engaged so um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember the 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 lettering for diamonds mm -hmm. but there's a big difference between say a, an f and a, a g or a right. f and an a I, you know i don't again i'm spitballing on the letters but yeah yeah so 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 while jewels are a little bit more um compartmentalized in their value structure there is a value structure just like art, right? Uh, so I, I, you know, I don't, I don't totally disagree with your jeweler friend, but I, 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 I don't think it's as, I think it's more nuanced than he's let, letting it on. C certainly, and believe me, this was all based on you know right after we had filmed our first segment, and I was so excited, and I happened to be you know, thinking about what I needed to get my wife for Christmas, because of course, <laughs> you know, it's a really good fallback for me. So, uh, you know, I, I, I talked to him about it because again, these are two things that people of the ordinary world, jewelry and art that we may categorize in a similar way, but clearly just like somebody who doesn't know finance would think that somebody who's a portfolio manager has the same capability as somebody who understands insurance. Right. So, right. Totally different ballparks, but in in average American mind, very similar. Don't know what's good, what isn't, and being able to understand it that way made me feel better about you know separating that money yeah. from my wallet. And, and, further, <laughs> and further, and furthermore, I, you know, I I have a very good family friend that I've, that I've bought a lot of jewelry for my wife through. Um, and she is inexpensive because it's mostly wholesale and, you know, it's, I got a guy. You know? Yeah, 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 for sure. I, I got a guy. I have a it's woman. A, it's a, yeah. have a woman. Um, and so I can buy the same cut flawless diamond from her that I could at Tiffany's. Tiffany's is going to be more expensive. Why? Because it has the name attached. It comes in the little blue box. Right. Uh, so so there's yet another example of how jewels do sort of fall into the same category as art. And look, Sotheby's and Christie's have just as many jewelry sales in just as many places as the 20th and 19th century contemporary art auctions. That's a very good point. Um, yeah. yeah. So you know, uh, so there is a market set on on certain certain types of art. You know, mm -hmm. deco art, deco jewelry. Um, you know. Precious gemstones, you know, you see those those sales in Geneva, just as you do with watches, you know. Mm -hmm. So, so going back to the uh, so Hill, could you throw up the picture of the actual kind of that the store or the 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 art shop as a, as a whole, where it had all the different types of stuff that they had in there? Because it wasn't just as you mentioned, two dimensional, hang on the wall. It was pottery. There was bronze. There was art. There was a lot. You know, and it was like an antique store. Exactly, exactly. And it's the the thing that I found fascinating is that like 
you know, again, it at the time, gorgeous, love it. But as you said, you don't know what it's going to look like on your wall. You don't know what the cost is going to be. You don't know if that's a fair price to pay. So if you were, and this goes back to, I know it's a, a I don't want to pigeonhole you by saying, so is this a good deal? Right. What for, for somebody who was decorating a home that wouldn't mind maybe making an investment, uh, is there a range where you would start? Like, you know, if it's a 500, like I say a lot to, to my, my clients when they're coming in or somebody who wants to be my client, you know, what's your portfolio look like? And if you've got, you know, if it's low six figures, it's like I could give you, it would be a waste of your time. Right. I, it's like trying to hang the picture with the, they, uh, the, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so, so, so is there a price point where if someone is willing to pay this, this is when they should start talking to a dealer who deals with collectibles as well. Right. Because I mean, instead of throwing away $5,000, maybe you should invest the $5,000 in something that may hold value as well. Yeah. So yeah, the, the excellent, excellent point. It is hard to tell someone to not go and spend $5,000 and fill four walls and two tabletops because a store like that, which looks like it has perfectly nice things, it's not, I'm not disparaging the store, um, has that sort of, you know, it's like in sports, the best ability is availability. Well, they have the availability of all this art and pottery and uh, sculpture but you know it, if if you're looking to fill walls sure you know five thousand dollars is you know you could probably do quite a bit of damage in that store but if you want something that's gonna you'd be surprised that one horse town painting was like 15 15 000. right yeah wow okay yeah so now there's an artist that's probably got some some local following that probably has a little bit of a, a market out there. Um, I have no idea who the artist is, so I'm sure, you know, yeah. Um, but at a certain point, your, your, your money is going to dictate you getting some sort of advice because whatever you pay the um, consultant or the dealer or the, you know, at some point that's going to save you on the other end. Correct. Right. Um, and instead of blindly going in and being like, "Oh my God, this matches the drapes," and you know, we've we've been to Fredericksburg and it's amazing, and isn't it great to have this old hotel painting in our house? Mm -hmm. You know. But if you're if you're looking to spend a lot of money on art, then spending fifteen thousand dollars on that painting may not be something that's that's negligible in the art portfolio or collection at the end of the day. I, I just, you yeah. know, I think, I think you really have to, to, to draw the line between, Oh my, I love this. I don't care what it's worth. I'm buying it mm -hmm. to like, boy, I love this, but it's never going to be worth anything, you know? So I want to frame this comment uh, with, one of my clients said to me once, um, once you see something a certain way, he's a plastic surgeon. So when okay. someone walks in the door, he sees their flaws immediately. And he says, right. it's a curse because I see what I can do to make it better. Sure. Um, and so the same thing for me with money, it's like the, the jaded part of it is like, I would rather spend $15,000 on a early investment than I would on fifteen thousand dollars on a piece of art unless i knew that it was going to have some kind of retention value like i right. for me as much as i like it and it looks pretty i'm going to think about it in a different way perhaps right. because of my yeah. profession so for me every dollar that i would put into something like that i would want to see that there perhaps would could be a return for the next generation so that's totally different so under that preemption what would be Let's say that you wanted to get started with your collection. You're still unsure, so you don't know what uh, – you're of means, and you want to decorate. Perhaps you just want to collect, but perhaps you just want to you know, use it for your house as well. Is there a price point at which it makes sense to consult a dealer? Oof. Um, 
<laughs> I think consulting a dealer, the first thing it does, forgetting pushing money aside is the um the sort of the time. Let to me save. also let me let me also if I could <coughs> yeah. is there a model for dealers where you can pay them like in the financial services industry where you can pay them for the advice for the time as opposed to uh, as a percentage of a purchase. For as long as people have been buying art, dealers have structured their fee uh, in every way you could possibly imagine. <laughs> okay. With it. With it. And I'm not being coy with you. I a really good friend, she charges by the app. I have a uh, another really good friend, retainer. I have another good friend, percentage of every sale. It's it's boundless. There's Great. no so it's really how you and your collector, and I'm talking from from so in other words, if you you're my collector, uh, Frank, you know how much do you want to spend? How, how many transactions a year, um, what type of art, um, how much time do you want to spend doing this? Is, it, is, this, is, it, is this to decorate your house? Is this to put together a portfolio of emerging artists that will one day hopefully be worth something? And based on all those answers, that's how I think the fee structure will, will, will turn out. You know, okay. um, what's the most common way? Oof. Probably, you know, there's usually a small discount involved with most art purchases. Um, sometimes the consultants are given that discount. Therefore, the client knows they're not paying any more than the asking price and their, their dealer is covered, their advisor is covered, uh, and they feel like their advisor is uh, going to bat for them in the most um, advantageous way for them. In other words, if you, if, if you and I have agreed that I'm getting 10% of, a, of any transaction that we make together, I'm going in fighting for the best price possible. You know you're giving me 10%. You're not getting anything over. That I always feel is the, is the sort of best way because then I'm really advocating for you, mm -hmm. not for myself. I'm covered, you know. Mm -hmm. Um, so I'm I'm basically just your cut man in the corner of a boxing ring. Right. And here's here's the way I see it for anybody doing anything or buying anything of value is maybe the first or the second one, I'm willing to take the blow to know what the process is gonna look like for future sure. transactions. So for me, for example, buying a car, uh you can do all the research you want online and figure it out until you get to the dealership. And then there are the incidental fees that they try to oh do. And depending yeah. on the type of personality type you have, whether you're the kind of person that's going to just say, okay, or you're going to smile like me and say, how do we get this price to this number right here? Right. Yeah. Um, and I'll let you get me on the and, yeah, and I'll let you get me on the warranty. How about that? Why don't we, you know, totally. but uh, you know, f what I like to think of it is like, it's like, dating this is what i tell my clients whenever they're coming in as prospects and say if they want to work together it's like you you're going to be doing this for a long period of time if you want to be a collector you want to make sure that the dealer that you work with is on the same side of the table trust is the number one factor you want to make sure because you know that 10 percent rule could go the other way as well it could be somebody who's really hungry and say well then i want to get the highest price because i'm going to make 10 percent on a higher price right so yeah although you know you're always starting at a number so if something's ten dollars you know it's ten dollars the person you're buying from those is ten dollars and the person you're representing those is ten dollars so Yes, I mean, could we? Could oh, but we, that. Yeah, but you're assuming that it's not somebody that doesn't know that they're. You're going to go into that shop in Fredericksburg and say, "This is a really good piece of art." I, I'm just saying that, like yeah, in your case, it's one sure. situation. Yeah. This, this, yes, this is all under the assumption of trust, which is, you know, you should almost do more research on the person you're going into business with or who you're going to hire as your art person than you than you than you can than you should on the actual art. Because, so, so in the case of in the case of uh, and again I keep using this because it happened right. So in the case yeah. of we went into the uh, we went into the gallery, 
we saw that painting. I was like, Amy, this is what I would like to see someday in our vacation home that looks like coach, right? I the, the, always have the log cabin in my mind, overlooking yeah. the river. The, the Wagon wheel, coffee table. Exactly. And so yeah. if I see that and she knows that I love it, and then she's like, oh, let's buy it now. And of course, for me, I would say, no, no, I have a guy. Let's talk to Max and say, this is kind of what I would like. This is the artist. This is the price. What yeah. do you think? And then Max would say, Hey, um, okay, I know that you like that, and now we have an idea of budget. That's a sixteen or so thousand dollar painting. I could show you some stuff that has stood the test of time, and that budget is fine for someone. What about? What do you think about this? Right. Oh, so maybe yeah. this one isn't because we don't know anything about it. But now you have a budget right. and place to start. So maybe that is when they would. How would that work? Oh, hey, what do you think? I like this piece. What do you think? You think it's worth it? Is that our consultative model in that direction as well or no? Yeah. I mean, uh, I, I've always said that the consultant, the, the best work the consultant does is on the stuff that he or she talks you out of, not the stuff that you buy. There you uh, go. The, the, the big mistakes, the, the, the overindulgent purchase, the reaching too far for something, because you like it and it seems perfect for the living room, but really it's it's too expensive or it's not an artist that's going anywhere or, you know. So yes, I mean, I think a good consultant is one that's saying no a lot. Um, that's saying like, ah, Frank, I don't know, man. This is, <laughs> you know, this is, just don't do it, you know. Yeah. Um, and then you get consultants who overreach and their vision for what you want sort of becomes their vision of what they want. And then that also is, you know, I've seen that sort of backfire. So, um, you know, they have relationships with artists and, you know, so that's where it gets a little sort of murky and cloudy. So I, I'm, I'm, I'm reluctant to sort of say, oh, you know, well, you should just listen to your consultant because sometimes, <laughs> sometimes they're wrong. You know, I mean, I, I admit that, you know, um, I, I try not to be wrong a lot, but, um, and then there are just times where the client wants to buy something and they're just going to buy it and, you know. It, it's their it, money and that's fine. It's their money and you're making a commission. And so, you know, you go and you make sure it's not a fake and, you know, you, um, you, know, you do the paperwork and organize the shipping and blah, 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 blah. And, you know, you've made $1,500 the easy way. I want to do another topic i want to talk about that how do you know it's not fake that or or, okay. or or even better like as again and i keep pointing to it but you know the lithograph at the cruise ship you know one of 16 uh and it's based on an artist or something you know what i mean it's like yeah. that that's a different level of fake right For you sure. know so um i went to a, a gallery in new hampshire last year and both Myself and my wife fell in love with this print, and it was beautiful. It was the actual artist. She had her own. Uh, she was on an art walk, and so we went in there, and I bought it. It was the Pavlova. I and I knew it. I knew we were going to get it because my wife saw it at a different time. She walked by. They walked in oh, wow. at a different yeah, time, and the then I walked in, and I walked by, and I was like, "That." Like the was, Royal's great flush of, of collecting when two people who are together see something separately and both love it. Yeah. So we knew we were going to get it. We bought it, and then whenever. Um, we were, you know, we, I wanted them to ship it because I didn't want to take it on the plane and the shipping was pretty pricey, but that's a whole different story as well. But should have taken it on the plane basically is what I'm saying. But anyway, right. uh, the shipping, when we were in the gallery writing it up, I saw that she had this enormous, you know, color printer and, you know, these are her pictures. Of course, these are, maybe she says that she's only going to sell 16, but she has them forever. And she, her, her, her family could continue to print more of these. So like, you know, right. for us in that case, we didn't care. We fell in love with the piece. But then that's another part of the discussion we had before as to you know, how many of these. Yeah, and how many of these are there going to be, right? Sure. So love yeah. to talk about, you know, fakes as far as yeah. I, I met a um, – bronze guy he makes the, a lot of the bronze statuettes and statues yeah. and i said hey i'd love to get you know start collecting some of that someday and he's like don't bother i was like why and he goes well because this is really easy to fake it's just right. get the original and cast it and then you think it was but it's not 
So there are all these other things to consider as well that aren't necessarily fake, but like you're not getting potentially the same right. value. A great example of that, although high end, is Dega, um, who did um, who did bronzes, um, uh, of ballerinas, and horses that are you know very beautiful and very sought after. However, he did not make one bronze during his lifetime. He made the casts. And the bronzes were made after he died, posthumously. But it is known that if you have certain past numbers from a certain foundry, from a certain range of dates, those are considered the most coveted and sought after. And, and different foundries under the permission of the foundation or the estate were were allowed to continue making them, but they have different marks on them. And yeah, that, that, that's great that you put, just put up. Um, so, you know. Uh, well, the, I mean, that one's $28,000. It's gotta be real, right? Right, exactly. <laughs> so so that, that, that actually may be, you know, a museum cast. Uh, yeah, and I know Saatchi and Saatchi. In the so last that, five you know, years, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, you know, there are, I think are, six or eight of the original tutu dressed um dancer and um you know they're 25 to 30 million dollars each so uh, so i'd be getting a great deal of 28 7 you'd be getting a great, great deal of 28 7 <laughs> you know. exactly um but um yeah so i, I think the, the main foundry uh rudier or something like that Th that was that but that was having that ex having that knowledge and knowing that yeah. those are the ones see those are the things that are really important that i feel when my clients are what, if you're my client already you know they're paying me assets under management a percentage of assets under management because that way you know they know and we know exactly what their mm -hmm. fee is going to be more or less at the end of the year but what is also uh equally as available is me 24 seven and they call and text and ask me questions on everything. Like, Hey, I've got a question on Medicare or health insurance or something, something that I don't get paid on directly, but they have access to me who know the answers. Right. Yeah. And so yeah. that's the same thing that I feel with having a guy, knowing a guy, knowing a girl, knowing, having, right. a, having a person that keeps you from making those, uh, those mistakes. Right. Um, and that, yeah, as I, as I did say to you, you know, I think the first time we met when I was talking about sort of dealing with new people, like first rule, first rule of bike club, you know, first rule of art collecting is if this isn't fun for you, then, you know, collect something else. It's really fun, <laughs> you know, uh, it's a dalliance. It's something that, you know, is for people who, you know, usually have means that, that doesn't mean not anybody can collect. That's not true. Um, but it's, 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 if, if it's not, if it's, if you're not having fun doing this, then eh, yeah, it shouldn't be a chore. Yeah. It should be a chore for me, not for the client. There you go. That's, that's the hook right there. That's the hook to be able to <laughs> use that tool. I had that conversation this morning. I have a client that's, uh, has a health insurance related issue. And I said, don't come up with these dialogues in your own head. Just call the phone number, add me as a contact, and let me fight it out with them. You yeah, just yeah. go do your job and let me handle right. that, yeah. right? So it shouldn't yeah. be a chore for you. Let it be a chore for a dealer. Let it be a chore for your your your, so your third party client, neutral, for lack of a I better term. I have a great client that, that's been collecting for a long time. He spends a lot of money on work, and a lot of times he'll just call me and be like, I saw this thing. Go do the due diligence. That's that's all he has to say, you know. And then I know that's that's a that's a code for I'm really interested in this. Is this price the right price? Should we be buying this? Where like get involved. That's you it. Know? That's it. Yeah. Whereas perfect. whereas if he if if I offer him something and he's sort of like ah, then I'm just like okay. Like as I say, you know, uh, telling me what you don't like is often more helpful than what you do like. Right. It's great. So. So how can people get in touch with you? How do people find out more about Max? Um, 
I am um, I'm I'm a free agent. I uh, I'm you can reach me uh, through my cell phone or through my Instagram um, at, at IB Projects. Um, and uh, yeah, I you know I'm I'm always looking to work with new people. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time, so it's it's uh, you know it's it's natural to me. It's great. So why don't we uh, why don't we stop there and we'll right. pick this up next time with uh, another fun topic. Can't wait. Great. It's great talking Thanks, to you. Man. Thanks. Man. Bye. Bye. Hey, thanks for watching The Merge. We've got a ton more stuff for you to watch on YouTube, on Instagram, on TikTok, everywhere. Check us out.